Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast, Measuring Software Productivity, sponsored by Constructs. I'm Tracy Cook with Application Development Trends, and I'm your host for today's event. I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Before we begin, I'd like to take care of a couple of housekeeping details. Please feel free to type your questions into the Ask a Question box on the console at any time during the presentation. We'll address as many of your questions as we can during the live event. For those of you interested in getting the presentation, it is available in PDF format on the bottom of your screen in the green resource folder. And finally, the entire webcast is being recorded and will be archived for future viewing. And we'll send you a link to the replay in the next 24 to 48 hours. And now I'd like to talk a little bit about our event and introduce our main speaker. Steve McConnell, CEO and Chief Software Engineer of Constructs. He's a respected author and thought leader on software development best practices. Steve's books, Code Complete, Rapid Development, and other titles are some of the most accessible books on software development with more than a million copies in print in 20 languages. Steve leads a team of seasoned trainers and consultants that has helped hundreds of companies solve their software challenges um, by identifying and adopting practices that have been proven to produce high-quality software faster and with greater predictability. So we're very lucky to have Steve with us today. He's always a great presenter, and I'd like to welcome you, Steve. Please take it away. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, well, I am lucky today because I get to do a presentation on one of my favorite topics, uh, indeed one of the topics that got me interested in more formal approaches to software development many, many years ago. Uh, this topic of measuring productivity along with the topic of software estimation, which is a related topic, uh, really are, are largely responsible for my interest in diving deeper into the ins and outs of software development. Interesting thing about measuring software productivity is it's very nice to have uh, more than two minutes to explain the topic. Uh, this is a topic that really requires uh, an exploration of the ins and outs of uh, elements of the topic and before you can really make the points that need to be made on the topic. So it's wonderful to have, uh, and often we, we find ourselves trying to explain this in a two or three minute a conversation and it's really, really difficult to do that. So what I would like to invite the audience to do today is to join me on a journey, uh, an exploration of the ins and outs of measuring software productivity. It would be wonderful if the journey was a nice, peaceful, enjoyable journey uh, as shown on the slide here where we've got smooth sailing and calm waters. The reality is when we talk about measuring productivity, the journey is going to look a little bit more like this where we're going to be sailing into some stormy seas. We're going to find things that are difficult or impossible to do. And there's a question at the end of whether we've actually achieved success or failure. But that's, that's what makes it a journey. So let's start with the, the fundamental question of why would we measure productivity? And I think before we can answer that question, we have to talk about what level of productivity do we even want to measure. We could measure productivity at the organization or company level. Companies certainly like to do that or want to do that. We can measure productivity at the team or work group level, or rather, I should say, we want to measure productivity sometimes at the team or work group level. That's the group five to nine person size range. And then, of course, companies also sometimes want to measure productivity at the individual contributor level. Uh, the ins and outs of these are different at the different levels, and the reasons and motivations are different as well. What companies we have worked with over the years have told us about why they would like to measure productivity at the organizational level uh, includes points like these. They'd like to assess competitiveness with other organizations, and a measurement of productivity would help them do that. They'd like to track and evaluate progress over time so they know whether they're getting better or worse or staying the same. They'd like to uh, use productivity measurements to, uh, as one input into bonus calculations for their software executives, uh, uh, and also a performance, out, for performance evaluation of their software executives. And then a key question that's been coming up for probably 15 years now with regularity is they like to use a, a performance or a productivity measures to decide where they, whether they should allocate resources onshore or offshore or in-house or outsourced. So these are the kinds of, of reasons that we hear expressed by the companies we work with. 
I want to be clear, these are not my reasons for measuring productivity. These are the reasons we have heard from the companies that we work with. When we get to the team or work group level, the reasons we've heard vary a little bit. Uh, one reason would be to compare teams to see who's better and who's worse, uh, really with the goal of uh, holding up the better performing teams so that other teams can learn from them. Uh, supporting performance evaluations of team managers would be another motivation. Along with that, supporting allocation of bonuses across managers and across teams and the individuals within the teams. And then, of course, the additional consideration of this allocation of work onshore versus offshore. When we get to the individual level, uh, similar kinds of reasons that we've heard from companies we've worked with. Uh, companies want to support allocation of people or resources across teams. So part of knowing how productive people are is knowing how many of them you're going to need. Uh, there's clearly some interplay between measuring productivity and estimation. Uh, they'd also like to measure individual productivity as a factor to consider in individual performance reviews, uh, and then as also a factor in uh, individual bonuses. So again, these are not my reasons. These are the reasons that we have heard over the years from companies that we have worked with. Now, I think as we begin to talk about actual measurement of productivity, not just why we want to do it, but how we would do it, there are two issues that turn out to be potentially problematic in measuring productivity. And those two issues are, number one, measuring, and number two, uh, productivity. Uh, these are both problematic. And uh, so let's uh, uh, map out where we're going to go today. Uh, and where we're going to go today is uh, we are going to start by talking about why measure productivity, which we have now done. I want to talk a little bit about what is productivity, because an awful lot of the issues that come up in measuring productivity actually come down to the real question of maybe not really having a clear definition of what productivity is. Obviously, it gets hard to measure something if we don't even know what, what we're measuring. Then we need to get into a little bit of a discussion of uh, the, the large differences in productivity between individuals and teams, because that does affect our ability to measure. Uh, and then talk a little bit about evaluating the measures of individual productivity and of team productivity. And when I say evaluating the measures, meaning taking a look at, in a systematic way, which measures are better measures and which measures are worse. And then finally draw some conclusions uh, from all of that. So let's turn then to that next topic of what is productivity. Uh, at the simplest level, and I think it's important to look at this beginning at the simplest level, is productivity is defined as output divided by input. Now, if you think this is overly simple, uh, I would agree it's very simple, but I would not agree that it's overly simple because an awful lot of the issues that are related to productivity and measuring productivity can be resolved by simply referring back to this definition, which is to say uh, the lack of understanding that productivity equals output divided by input or lack of clarity about what are the outputs and what are the inputs uh, actually, that gives rise to a lot of the issues that we see in attempting uh, to measure productivity and, for that matter, in failed attempts to measure productivity. So let's start by taking a look at what is an output. And this really is one of the two key questions. Uh, one of the more common things that people try to measure when they measure productivity is lines of code. And the question is, is lines of code really an output in economic terms? When we're talking about productivity, we're clearly talking about an economic concept. So is lines of code really an output in economic terms? I think that's a very questionable claim. Uh, lines of code uh, don't, the, you know, we, we have lots of data that says different people given the same assignment will vary by a factor of 10 uh, in the number of lines of code they take to complete the assignment. So at best, lines of code is uh, an approximation of programming output, much less economic output. Uh, similarly, function points. Function points are more closely uh, tied to functionality, uh, but still, is that functionality really economic value, or is it just technical functionality that may or may not be output in economic terms? Uh, is work on a project that gets canceled output? Maybe people can do lots of work, they generate lots of lines of code and lots of function points, but if the project ultimately goes down the drain and never produces any business value, then it's hard to define that as output in economic terms. Uh, similarly, is work on a project that is delivered successfully in a technical sense, but that ultimately fails in the marketplace, 
again, failing to produce business value, is that considered to be output? Well, you know, from one perspective, from the technicals perspective, maybe it is, but from the business perspective, it really, really is not. Uh, so the kinds of outputs that uh, people tend to talk about on this topic uh, look kind of like this. Uh, they could be things like number of product releases. So that's a pretty big thing. Number of products, another big thing. Revenue, profit. Uh, so these are all business-oriented measures, not really technically-oriented measures. And if we're going to talk about productivity, at some point in the discussion, we ought to talk about business-oriented measures. Uh, we could also talk about uh, more technically-oriented measures like bug fixes or closed change requests. Uh, we could talk about quality measures like hours of uptime or service level attained. And then I think some very kind of uh, more amorphous issues, support for company strategy. It's interesting, but when you get to the upper levels in an organization, you know, measuring productivity really does come down to, uh, to some degree to how well the team executes in supporting the chosen company strategy. You can't really fault the team for the company strategy being wrong, uh, but you can give it credit for the degree to which it either supports or doesn't support the, the strategy that is chosen by the top leadership in the organization. And related to this then would be score on a balanced scorecard, which typically, if it's well crafted, is going to be structured in a way that does in fact capture whether at the degree to which the team is supporting the company strategy. So candidate outputs, uh, so those, those are some thoughts about the inputs. And when we talk about candidate outputs, uh, actually, I'm sorry, that's, I misspoke there. Uh, those are some thoughts about the outputs. Uh, and I think most of these measures of output are, as you might have noticed, impossible to measure at the individual level. How could we possibly measure support for company strategy in a meaningful way at the individual level? Um, they're extremely difficult to measure at the team level because we're still typically too far removed from the overall company level of profit, loss, revenue, company strategy, and so on. Um, I think a lot of times they're problematic to measure even at the company level. Uh, we have uh, done workshops, conducted workshops, where we try to put together scorecards for uh, the degree to which teams support company strategy. Uh, it's definitely possible to do that, and you can come up with some pretty satisfactory uh, uh, programs for doing that, but it's a fair amount of work. It's not something where you just sit down for half an hour. It's more like a multi-day activity that involves uh, the leadership of the organization and so on. So uh, there definitely is some work involved measuring even at the company level. So what outputs we measure are what we do in practice is we tend to measure proxies. That is, we measure things that are easier to measure than the things we really care about and that we hope are an approximation of the things that we really care about. So we measure proxies like function points, and we hope that those proxies have something to do with the actual business output uh, that we would ideally like to measure. And as a result of that, because those are approximations, that can introduce some error into our measurement program. Turning now to the inputs, the inputs uh, in that productivity formula of output divided by input, the inputs uh, are the things that we often talk about in a technical sense. Technical staff hours would be typical. Technical staff cost, which is related to technical staff hours, but for salaried employees, that's not exactly the same as staff hours. Uh, we also have issues like business staff hours needed to support the technical staff. So we have uh, product uh, owner, product manager, uh, people who maybe aren't directly on the development team. Maybe they are, are multitasked across multiple projects, plus they may have some other responsibilities. Uh, but their effort is actually essential to getting the project done, so those hours ought to be counted somehow. We have other business staff hours needed to support the technical staff, not in defining requirements, but say management time or upper management time, uh, steering committee reviews, manager travel time to India to uh, coordinate work between two teams, that kind of thing. We have investment in travel. We have investment in hardware and other infrastructure, including communications infrastructure to support uh, onshore, offshore development. Uh, and then, of course, we have the delta in technical debt, pre-project versus post-project. And all of the items that are shown with yellow asterisks on the slide are difficult to measure uh, at or above the individual contributor level. We can measure them at the corporate level, but trying to allocate uh, product manager time or product owner time to an individual project, trying to allocate 
the travel time of a manager who goes to India to work with a number of teams, allocating that to specifically to teams or specifically to individuals, that becomes an exercise in approximation at best. Now, even the easy inputs on that list are more difficult to measure than you might think. Uh, even the measures like technical staff hours, you could think that uh, measuring the number of technical staff hours on a project would be a straightforward activity. What we have found is that is not at all the case. Uh, organ we worked with one organization, for example, uh, that had a detailed time tracking system in place, and the staff was entering their hours and assigning their hours to individual projects and tasks. And the organization was quite convinced that it had very high fidelity data that it could use for measuring technical staff hours applied against individual projects. Well, when we got in and started inter interviewing staff and reviewing the data, what we found was that the staff didn't have any idea why they were entering their time data into a time accounting system. And so what they had done is one of the staff members had created a script that automatically entered uh, time. And that script had been widely circulated throughout the technical staff. And as a result, the hours that were getting entered were not applied to the project they need to get applied to. Uh, and the time accounting data was worthless. Uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was actually worse than useless because you could possibly interpret it as meaning something different, vastly different than it actually did mean. So uh, even measuring the simple things that you think you could just count as you go uh, are by no means a guarantee of having an accurate measure. So this is yet another way that error can creep into our measurement or our attempts to measure uh, productivity. So if we take a look seriously at this simple defini definition of productivity, of output divided by input, what we find is the definitions of output and input, uh, not only are they difficult to define and subject to error in measurements, they also change from the individual level to the work group level to the team level to the company level and so on. What is meaningful as input, what is meaningful as output are not the same thing for an individual as for a business unit or a company. Uh, and there is a lot of work involved in attaining business buy-in to the definitions at any one of these levels. Uh, and as I said a few moments ago, this is typically a multi-day uh, workshop activity to attain buy-in from the business uh, really at any one of these levels and uh, it becomes a more extensive exercise to attain buy-in at all the levels you need to roll up the measures from the individual level all the way up to the top of the company. Uh, and uh, so I guess just to take a checkpoint on where we are in the conversation and our journey so far, recognize that we're at a point where we haven't found any great solutions to the problem of even defining what the inputs or outputs we want to measure are, much less actually measuring it. So. Uh, in very simple terms, we still have a long way to go before we're going to be successful in measuring productivity. All right, so having uh, made some comments and uh, made a little bit of progress, I think, hopefully in uh, mapping out what some of the issues are with uh, defining productivity, let's turn now to the question of measurement. And as we turn to the question of measurement, we have to look at the topic of underlying 10x differences or tenfold differences in productivity. We have to do that because it, it affects everything else we do in measuring productivity. Now, suitably for purposes of this talk, the idea of a 10x difference in programmer productivity originated in a search for measuring productivity. Uh, the original study on this topic was conducted by Sackman, Erickson, and Grant in 1968, so uh, almost 50 years ago. And what they were trying to do 50 years ago was they were trying to determine whether programmers working in online environments were more productive than programmers working in offline environments. So was online more uh, productive than batch mode? Now, the particular question they were looking at seems uh, horribly antiquated and uh, almost a little bit humorous from today's perspective, but that was what they were trying to look at in, 19, in 1968. And what they found was that the original goal of their research to determine whether online or offline was more productive was thwarted by the fact that individual productivity differences that they observed <clears throat> drowned out the differences that could be attributed to online versus offline performance. So in essence, they weren't able to make any statement about whether online or offline performance uh, was more productive because uh, the confounding factor of individual variability was so much greater than any variability that could possibly be attributed to online or offline performance. 
And what they found in their study was that all of the programmers in their study had at least seven years of experience. So these were practicing professional programmers who were reasonably experienced. They found that the range of initial coding times varied by a factor of 20 to 1. They found the range of debugging times, so-called, varied by a factor of 25 to 1. And I say so-called because the word debugging in 1968 didn't mean the same thing that it means today. Uh, back in 1968, the word debugging basically meant unit testing and debugging in today's terminology. So, uh, but in the study, it's referred to as debugging. Uh, they found the range of program sizes produced varied by 5 to 1. The range of execution speeds varied by 10 to 1. So really, across the board, there were these significant differences in uh, how programmers performed given very, very similar or identical tasks. And what that leads us to for the purpose of measuring productivity is that we get scenarios like this. Let's say that we have uh, Team A and Team B and that we, uh, by some measure, whether it's lines of code per staff month or function points per staff month or something else, we have determined that the productivity of Team A is higher than the productivity of Team B. Team B. And let's say, furthermore, that Team A is using pair programming and Team B is using formal inspections. Well, what does that allow us to conclude about pair programming versus formal inspections? Well, in a very simplistic view of the difference in performance, we might conclude that this this means that pair programming is, uh, contributes to higher productivity than formal inspections does. But let's throw in some other considerations. Let's point out that in this example, this hypothetical example, Team A was comprised of star performers, whereas Team B was comprised of average performers. And now, which method is better? Well, now we're not quite sure. Well, let's say furthermore that Team A's normal productivity range is as shown by the box and whiskers chart and Team B's normal range is as shown by its box and whiskers chart. And what we see is that Team A was performing at the low end of its normal range, and Team B was performing at the high end of its normal range. And so now, what can we conclude about uh, pair programming versus formal inspections? Well, the fact of the matter is, we could look at this, and again, it's a little bit simplistic to say, well, if Team A was using pair programming and that led it to perform at the low end of its range, and Team B was using formal inspections, and that led it to perform at the high end of its range, that might lead us to believe that inspections actually are better contribution to productivity than pair programming. But the fact of the matter is there are other confounding factors involved here. And so the real takeaway is we just don't know. Uh, we can't conclude anything uh, from the data that we're looking at. And in very general terms, what the, the, the effect that this uh, 10x difference in individual productivity has, and I should say, I use the phrase 10x to refer to, generically speaking, a large difference in individual productivity. The consensus of the research is actually closer to 20 to 1 rather than 10 to 1, but either way, it's a very large difference observed in productivities of different individuals. And we've also observed large differences in team productivity. It's not quite as extreme as the individual variations, but still somewhere between 3 x to 10x differences in team productivity. So as the, the line shows on the left, we have this enormous typical variation in individual and team productivity compared to a typical variation in method productivity that might be something more like on the order of 20%. So we're, looking, we're trying to find a 20% variation against a 10x variation background. And this becomes virtually like looking for a needle in a haystack. It's, it's basically impossible to figure out what is the real dynamic or what is the real effect of a methodology change when we've got such vast differences in individual productivity. Uh, there have been numerous studies on this topic over the years. Uh, many of these studies are not super recent. And this falls into the category of if you conduct similar studies over and over again and they all find the same thing, at some point you stop doing new studies on the topic. Uh, but in general, we've got lots of studies that have found on the order of 10 or more uh, uh, to 1 difference in individual productivity and three, somewhere in the range of 3 to 10 uh, differences in team productivity. So uh, what is, why does all this matter? Well, it matters differently depending on why you want to measure productivity. If you're measuring productivity to assess the impact of a process or a practice or an environmental factor or the effectiveness of a manager uh, or anything like that, 
then your attempt to measure will be subject to the confounding factor of the 10x variation, and your measurement is just not going to be valid. If, on the other hand, you want to measure productivity because you're trying to assess the individual or team productivity per se, that is, you're actually trying to measure the difference in individual productivity, then your measurement in that case is confounded by all of the myriad of uncontrolled variables, including the processes, practices, environmental differences, management, uh, stability and requirements, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and that measurement is not likely to be accurate either. So either way, this is highly problematic. Uh, we also find some differences in uh, measuring in academic versus commercial settings. In some sense, this problem is a little bit easier in academic settings because we can control the variables better. Uh, but, and that's where a lot of the data comes from in terms of the studies on variation in productivity. Uh, as we get into more of a commercial setting, then we get more uncontrolled variables and confounding factors, and that just makes the problem more significant. Uh, my interest for most of my career has really been more in the commercial setting than in the academic uh, setting, so really the rest of this uh, presentation will focus on measurement in the commercial setting. All right, so let's take a look at evaluating possible measures of individual productivity. So now I'm going to propose uh, I'm going to propose a set of measures. I'm going to propose some standard or criteria for evaluating those measures, and then I'm going to take a look at how the different measures stack up against those evaluation criteria. <clears throat> so common individual productivity measures, common in practice, commonly discussed in the literature, would include measures like this, lines of code per staff month, function points per staff month, story points uh, per staff month in an Agile context, 360-degree peer evaluations, and I, I acknowledge that that's, uh, we're kind of uh, questionable whether that's really considered to be a measurement, but I think it's important to include that because it accomplishes many of the same things that we're trying to accomplish with, measure, with measurement. So if we evaluate it against a measurement-oriented set of criteria, then I think it's useful to throw it in the mix and see how it, how it compares. Manager evaluation, same basic idea. Let's throw it in the mix and see how it compares using the evaluation criteria that we would use for evaluating measures. Uh, task completion predictability, not a very common measure, but one that uh, people talk about from time to time, just how reliable is an individual at doing what they said they were going to do when they said they were going to do it. Test cases passed is an interesting one. And then defect counts, just a raw count of how many defects that individual produces. So these are some common individual productivity measures. Uh, criteria for good individual productivity measurement are as shown on the slide. I'm going to talk through these points individually. This presentation will be archived and available on an archival basis, so if you're listening at some future time to the archival version of this presentation, you could pause it right here and take a look at the overall lay of the land, but for, for now I'm going to talk through these one at a time. So the first criteria is that the measurement truly reflects productivity. And we have a long history in software, as well as in other fields, of just measuring whatever is easy and readily available to measure. It doesn't mean it's a good measure. It's very much like the drunk who lost his keys down the street, but he's looking for them under the lamppost because that's where the light is the brightest. It's not a good basis for where we look for our keys. Measuring something just because that's an easy way to measure it is not a good criteria on its own for why we would choose a particular measurement, but we are guilty of that in software. And I think lines of code fall into that category. They're easy to measure. Uh, whether they're good or not, we'll get to momentarily. Same thing for story points. They're easy to measure. They're an organic part of uh, Agile projects, but whether they're good or not is an entirely different matter. Uh, we would also ideally like our measurement to directly or indirectly account for most or all of the work output. So um, that would include the work from the beginning of the project to the end. That would include work on revising code, not just creating new code. Uh, fixing code, um, modifying code, etc. Uh, so we'd like it to account for most or all of the work output. Uh, relatedly, we'd also like it to account, uh, be useful for measuring work of non-programmers. So uh, testers or documenters or scrum masters or product owners or business analysts, we would like it ideally to be able to measure their work uh, as well. Uh, we would like the measurement to resist gaming uh, by individual contributors. That is, uh, in management, we have this saying that what gets measured gets done. And for simplistic measures, we often have the case that people optimize for the measure, 
rather than optimizing for the work that we're actually trying to measure, and that becomes problematic and something that we would really like to avoid. Uh, we also, uh, uh, and we have to account for the idea that work tends to slide from measured activities into unmeasured activities uh, to optimize the measure, or it slides toward the measured activities, depending on whether the measure is a good measure or a bad measure. The general rule here is that any single dimension measure is going to be subject to problems like this. So that tells us right from the get-go that probably we're going to have something different than just a one-dimensional productivity measure. Uh, we also would like the measurement ideally to be strongly correlated with business value created. We would like it to have something to do with uh, do the people on this team positively contribute to the business overall. And measures like uh, lines of code or story points might be loosely related to the business value created. Ideally, we'd like to find something that is more strongly uh, related to business value. Uh, we also ideally would like the measurement to be objective, repeatable, and independently verifiable. We would like three different people who measure the same set of individual contributors to come back with the same results or the same measures. Uh, and if they don't come back with the same measures, that would be a criticism of the measure itself. Uh, we would also like the measurement to measure output the same regardless of programming language used. And this is problematic for lines of code in particular just because uh, lines of different programming languages produce different amounts of functionality per line of code. Uh, and the chart you see on your screen is lines of code per function point. But we've got you know, maybe a three-fold, four-fold, five-fold difference depending on what comparison we're making in the amount of functionality produced per line of code depending on what programming language we're using. And we don't want our measurement to be dramatically affected just because we switch from one programming language to another. Uh, we can get in some really misleading conclusions about that if we're not careful about how we're looking at uh, that language-specific data. Uh, ideally, we would like our uh, measurement to support cross-project comparisons. We would like to have a measure from one project be directly comparable to a measure from another project without having to go through any kind of translation. We would like the measure to account for this phenomenon that we tend to give the most difficult assignments to the best people. And so if we have a simplistic measure of productivity, we're not accounting for the idea that our best person is actually doing the hardest work. And this is a problem in programming. It's a problem that's reported in measuring uh, the effectiveness of doctors or surgeons where the most uh, talented surgeons get the most challenging patients. Uh, and so the cure rates are not really directly comparable from one surgeon to another. Same issue comes up in education where we sometimes see uh, the best teachers getting the most challenging students. Uh, and so measures of student outcomes are not always what they appear to be uh, when they're used to evaluate uh, individual educators. Same issue applies in programming. And then finally, all other factors being equal, Sure, it would be nice if the data could be collected easily and cheaply. I don't see this as a primary driver of the decision about what measurement to use, but I definitely see it as a tiebreaker where if we could measure something with low effort, all of the things being equal, we would certainly like to do that compared to uh, a measure that was equally valid in other respects but uh, required more effort. So let's turn now to then to evaluating the measures using the criteria that I just defined. And what I've done is I've put together a scale from 1 to 5 where 1 means that the measure does terribly against that particular criteria, and 5 means that the measure uh, performs excellently against that particular criteria. Uh, and I'm going to show you uh, briefly a scoring rubric that, rubric that scores the different measures. And I will acknowledge from the get-go that the following scoring is subjective. It is based on my judgment uh, about how each of these measures performs against each of, the, each of these criteria. I do have some rationale for each of the scores. So every single cell in the table is actually, there is a reason behind it. Uh, but, the, but what I will say is whether the individual scores are subjective or not, the, what this uh, approach has in favor of it is that it is structured. Uh, so there is a method to the madness. Um, it is an open process. You can actually, it's explicit. You can look at what the scores are. It's not just that I'm making some vague argument about I really prefer one measure over another without telling you why. Uh, and it's reviewable. You could actually review it. You could go through every single cell in this table if you were so inclined. Uh, and you could come to your own conclusions about whether you agree with me or disagree with me 
uh, and we would know exactly where we agreed or disagreed because it's explicit and structured uh, and reviewable. Uh, okay, so uh, so the the conclusions here, and again, if you're watching this presentation uh, after the fact, you could just pause on that point, which might be a good thing to do. For now, we're going to go ahead and move on uh, and make some observations. Well, one observation is that lines of code per staff month is easily the worst measure, score of 2.5. It's subject to all kinds of issues like the cross-language uh, cross comparison it performs poorly at, not very related to the business value, it's subject to uh, gaming. So there are a lot of uh, limitations of lines of code per staff month. Uh, no measure does better than 4.1 on a five-point scale. So we don't have any answer that's truly great here, according to this scoring rubric. And the top six measures are actually pretty closely ranked. They range from 3.7 to 4.1. And given uh, the somewhat subjective nature of the scoring in the first place, it's unclear, you know, it's not a guarantee that a 3.7 is automatically worse than a 3.8 given uh, the nature of the inputs. And so I would say that for practical purposes, the top six measures are essentially tied. The number one scoring measure is test cases passed, and that does resist gaming if you have independent testing. Uh, that is, uh, somebody else determining whether the, designing the test cases and determining whether they pass, the code passes the test cases. But as we move into more agile practices with uh, many teams now not having independent testing, then the overall score actually drops to a 3.9, uh, making that range of the top six even tighter, going between 3.7 to 3.9. And then I think it's worth calling out the fact that manager evaluation does better than you might expect as a measure when we evaluate it as a measure, uh, it ha and it has the best effort rating, uh, and it's normally the most readily available. So this is kind of an interesting, kind of a, an interesting result because we have something that we don't think of as a measure, that is manager evaluation, but when we score it along with a set of other measures, we find it actually performs pretty well. And so my conclusion on this, which as it shows on the slide is kind of a sunny day conclusion, the business problem that individual productivity measurement needs to address can actually be addressed more effectively by a non-measurement technique. We asked a measurement question, but the answer ends up not really being a measurement answer. So uh, I think this is a pretty interesting conclusion. All right, so that's where, where we are on individual productivity measures. And again, drawing, remembering that whatever measurements we had are still subject to all the issues we talked about with the definitions of input and output and the 10x uh, confounding phenomenon. Uh, those are all in play on these scorecards as, or this evaluation rubric as well. Let's spend just a couple minutes uh, applying the same basic practice to the idea of evaluating measures of team productivity. And in my picture here, I've got a shipwreck with dolphins swimming around it. I think it might be more appropriate to have a shipwreck with shark, sharks swimming around it, given the topic. But uh, uh, you can make your own determination after we go through this section. So possible team productivity measures are very similar uh, to the individual productivity measures, except for those measures with the asterisk by them. Uh, so we've added manager stack rank evaluations uh, as a team level evaluation. Uh, we've added project completion predictability rather than task level predictability for the team level evaluation. And then I've added the idea of a scorecard, uh, which I'll talk about in a little bit more, uh, a little bit more specifically uh, in a minute or two. Uh, the team level measurement considerations, the evaluation criteria, are similar but not identical to the individual evaluation criteria. And here again, let's focus on the items that uh, have changed, the ones with the asterisk by them. So we'd like the measure to be useful for measuring the work of the whole team, directly or indirectly. We'd like it to resist gaming not just by individuals but by the team. Uh, we would like the measure to be strongly correlated with business value created at the team level uh, this becomes something that we really ideally ought to be able to measure or get close to measuring business value created when we're talking about a whole team. Uh, it should accurately reflect the output of teams working on diverse kinds of projects. So if we have one team working on front end uh, of a system and another team working on, uh, say, a time critical a back end, we would like to be able to make cross-team comparisons, ideally accounting for the difference in the nature of the work assigned. Uh, we would like to account for the best teams getting the most difficult assignments. That's a factor at the team level just as it is at the 
individual level. So with that as prologue, uh, here is the scoring rubric that I came up with. I went through the same process as before. I could go through a detailed uh, ex explanation of why I landed on the score I did in each of the cells. I don't think anybody probably wants me to do that. Uh, if you're uh, watching this uh, presentation later, you could pause on this point and study, uh, study uh, the cells and see the degree to which you agree or disagree. Uh, but for now, let's uh, go ahead and move on to the summary comments. Uh, so once we, here we find again that lines of code per staff month is easily the worst measure, scoring 2.4. Uh, the scorecard is actually a clear number one, a score of 4.5. So on the, on the individual uh, productivity measures, the highest we got was a 4.1. Here with the scorecard, we end up with a 4.5. So it really stands out as being uh, the best measure according to the scoring criteria we have for measurements. And then once again, we have the next five measures that are closely ranked, essentially a five-way tie for second place. Uh, and at the team level, I'll point out that test cases passed is a lot more susceptible to gaming than it was at the individual level, because at the team level, we typically will have the so-called independent testing performed by test specialists who are actually part of the team. So if the team was so inclined as to game uh, its measurement system, then if testing was used as a measure, that would be more gameable at the team level than it was at the individual contributor level, even with independent testing. So uh, scorecard clear number one. Others are basically tied for second place with lines of code uh, bringing, up, bringing up the bottom of the ranking. Uh, since I've, uh, the score for the scorecard is so good, I thought it would be appropriate to show an example of a scorecard. And the key element of a scorecard is that it is going to evaluate a set of factors, not just an individual factor, but a set of factors that collectively give us a picture of how effective the team is. And so we have a variety of considerations on this example of a scorecard. It's all it is. It's an example. I'm not holding this out as canonical. I'm not holding out as something for anybody to copy. I'm just saying it's an example of a kind of a, an evaluation scorecard that would meet the criteria or would score according to the criteria that I used in the scoring rubric. So on time, event, on time delivery would be one possible uh, scorecard element. Initial defect rate would be another possible element, plus 90-day defect rate to assess both release quality and follow-on quality or longer-term quality. Percent of planned functionality delivered. So now we've got a quality measure, a schedule measure, and a functionality measure. This starts to make it really difficult for the team to game uh, the scorecard when we're measuring uh, the full complement of different uh, uh, criteria that the team would perform against. Early notification of problems, I think in general that's a good idea that contributes to uh, successful projects. And then a couple of fairly subjective elements, executive satisfaction with project execution and delivery, and sales satisfaction with project execution and delivery. So the point here is the team can do well by its own criteria. It also has to do well by other project stakeholders' criteria. And again, this is just being presented as an example, not as necessarily anything that anyone would copy in all the details. So comments about the scorecard. Really, the only significant weakness of the scorecard, in my mind, is its independent verifiability. But it publishes the rubric. It publishes the weighting of the different factors. Uh, it allows someone else to go in and independently review the scorecard and talk about it and discuss it and correct it if necessary. So it's not independently verifiable per se, but it is reviewable and arguable. Uh, and collectively, a group of managers could go through and talk about their scorecards and come to a consensus about what, what they really believe about a set of teams' scorecards. Uh, on the plus side, the scorecard is structured. It does avoid over-optimization for any one measure. It can be set up in a way that supports cross-project comparisons. And it can be made public, and it can be reviewed. Uh, and it certainly can and should be tailored so that it supports the organizational goals, meaning if a team scores well on the scorecard, then we can infer from that that the team is uh, significantly supporting the strategic objectives of the organization. Uh, so once again, we find, interestingly enough, that we have something that arguably is not really a measure but when we evaluate it according to the criteria we would use to evaluate measures, it actually scores the best. Uh, so once again, I am led to some fairly sunny conclusions. 
Uh, and my conclusions about the scorecard uh, are, well, my conclusions actually, let's just talk about overall conclusions. Um, true productivity measures in software, as we've discussed, are significantly limited. Agreeing on the definition of productivity is problematic in a significant way. Meaningful outputs are difficult or impossible to measure. Uh, indeed, we rarely measure real business outputs. Instead, we measure proxies, so we get measurement error by virtue of the fact that we're using a proxy rather than measuring the thing we really care about. Inputs are subject to significant measurement error. And the entire exercise is subject to massive measurement error because of this 10x variation phenomenon. Now, having said all that, I think we actually end up in a fairly happy place, which is that the questions that businesses want to answer through measuring productivity actually can be addressed pretty effectively through non-measurement or quasi-measurement approaches. And when we go through a structured evaluation or scoring of these different approaches, we find that these alternative approaches actually stack up very favorably versus measurement per se, especially when you fully account for the limitations that are involved in true measurement. So thank you very much for uh, joining me on this journey. I think at this point you can see why uh, a two-minute answer to the question of how do we measure productivity uh, ends up being really problematic. And I think a good journey is one uh, where we end up in a good location. I think uh, despite some storms along the way, we've ended up in a pretty good place. So. I will at this point uh, turn the microphone back over to Tracy and see if we have any questions. Oh yes, Steve, we have a lot of questions, so I hope you're you're ready. And I want to remind the audience that they can submit a question using the Ask a Question box on the left side of their console. And um, I think we'll just head right into it. You seem overly negative on lines of code per staff month. Academic research has shown that other measures, for example, function points do not perform better than lines of co code. Also, lines of code per staff month is the only measure that takes into account both output and input. Yeah, I, I am pretty negative on lines of code per staff month as a measure. That is a true statement. Uh, the comment that academic research has shown other measures like function points do not perform better than lines of code I think falls into the category of faint praise for lines of code. Uh, it is true that the other measures like function points really, uh, they perform better in some ways and worse in other ways, but they still don't perform well overall. So uh, I tried to preview the answer to this question a little bit in my comments by saying that you know, lines of code are subject to problems when we try to measure different projects that are being conducted in different programming languages. Uh, we can't typically directly compare the work done in different uh, programming languages when we measure based on lines of code. And I actually would not agree that lines of code measure both input and output in the terms as I've defined them. The input would be something more like uh, staff time. Uh, if we're going to measure productivity, it would be lines of code per staff month. So it would be the output would be lines of code and the input would be staff months. Um, and as I've said, I think the the measurement of staff months can be somewhat problematic. With discipline, that can be less problematic. Uh, but actually, a few organizations we've worked with have that discipline. And then putting lines of code as the output, we're so far removed from the business value created with lines of code that you know that's problematic. But we're also pretty far removed even from the technical output created because different uh, individuals can vary by up to a factor of 10 in the amount of lines of code they generate in solving any particular problem. And so uh, the measure is, and that can make somebody who's actually quite inefficient and writes lots of super bulky code look more productive than somebody who's actually more efficient and gets more actual work done, but just produces less lines of code to do it. So so I think there's a reason lines of code ends up at the bottom of the list. And, and uh, I would definitely stand by my comments on that. OK. How would you account for judgment difference between scores on different teams using the same scorecard? And then they say, uh, different interpretation, question mark. I, I, that's a legitimate question. Uh, so how do you account for judgment differences between different scorers who are scoring different teams? Uh, I think that that is something you'd have to be aware of in using the scorecard. You can't just have different managers each individually score their own teams and not go through some sort of a normalization process or have some super clear definitions of what different scoring levels mean on the scorecard. So it's absolutely true 
that for the same team, one manager might give that team a five against a particular criteria, and another manager might give that team a three against that particular criteria. So you know, one way to address that is through having really well-defined uh, uh, levels for each of the scores. So define what a one means, a two means, a three means, a four means, a five means. Uh, and that's a, certainly a fine way to do it. Another way to do it is to have the managers go through collaborative review of each other's scorecards. So if you have a business unit, the managers get together, they go over their team scorecards, and they're going to have some sense of how each other's teams are doing because they're talking about team performance on a regular basis amongst themselves anyway, uh, and then go through that process where they all kind of talk about how each of their teams scored and why they scored them that way. And that's going to result in the scores getting more centered on the numbers meaning the same thing on each scorecard. Okay, great. Thank and you. I guess I, one other thought is just that oh, sure. uh, the scorecard itself facilitates that kind of discussion. If you didn't have the scorecard, the managers would be having a much more fuzzy, subjective discussion where they're talking about which team is better, but without much structure behind why each team is better. With the scorecards in front of them, now the managers are actually centered on the criteria that the organization has decided they want to use for evaluating the performance of the team. So at least the managers are discussing the right criteria and have some chance of coming to consistency on the scores, whereas without the structure of a scorecard, you're not even settled on what the criteria are. So you're starting way behind uh, if you don't have something like that uh, in place. Oh, OK. Here's, um, here's another one. Would it be correct to say that the most important thing here is to educate the developers and managers about what constitutes true productivity? Now, that's an interesting question. Uh, would it be correct to say the most important thing is to educate developers and managers about what constitutes true productivity? I think that it's always useful to try to get uh, technical staff and managers aligned with the business objectives. So really understanding what is it that adds value to our business and what is it that's kind of extraneous uh, to our business. We always have this issue of individuals' values don't always align 100% with the business value. So an individual, for example, might value super high level of quality. And maybe that, that valuation of quality would be appropriate if they're working on medical devices, but maybe they're working on a web system. And so that personal value of quality is really kind of misaligned with what the organization needs for its particular kind of software. So uh, I do think that it's a good idea to get individuals and managers aligned with whatever the business's um, uh, values are. And I think a scorecard can be very helpful in doing that. Uh, you know, I think understanding the definition of productivity is a little bit to the side of that question. Um, but understanding maybe not productivity, but what is valued and how are individuals and teams going to be evaluated, that certainly is a tool that can support individuals and teams being aligned with the true objectives of the business. Okay. Another one interesting, an approach used by Total Quality Management, or Six Sigma, or SEI's TSP, is to hold the process variables fixed. Then you measure improvement over time for the same individual and team. Does that make measures as lines of code work any better? Yeah, so it's an interesting question. I think, you know, the, the claim is that uh, Six Sigma would hold the process variables constant. I think a better way to phrase that would be uh, Six Sigma tries to hold the process variables, variables constant. And in software, that, that might be possible in a manufacturing context. I really don't know. But in software, I think it's essentially impossible to hold the process variables constant over time. Uh, if we're changing the people we work with, uh, the people outside the team that we're interacting with, say the product owner changes or product management changes, uh, the number of people on the team change, the actual assignment, of course, is going to change because companies virtually never do the same project twice. The idea that we're holding the process variables constant is just not a realistic uh, description of whatever happens in a software project. So yeah, in, in a research setting, we could probably do a little bit better job of trying to hold some of those process variables constant. And then we could uh, look at performance of the same individuals from one experiment to the next. But you know, part of the issue is 
even if we have them do the exact same assignment, the fact that they've already done the assignment once uh, makes, it that it's, makes it so that it's not the same assignment next time. So as a practical matter, it just isn't possible to hold the process variables constant. We can say we're doing that, but we really can't practically do it. OK, thank you. Here's another one. It's a little shorter than the rest, so it might be a little easier. Isn't manager evaluation sometimes very subjective? Yeah, it is. It is, uh, it is uh, sometimes very subjective. And uh, we also have the issue that uh, if we want to talk about how, subject, how, how uh, subject is it to gaming, uh, we certainly have uh, sometimes people who are better at managing their managers than they are at really working effectively in a team. So, you know, by no means am I saying manager evaluation is a panacea. Bear in mind that the highest score uh, in that whole exercise was uh, 4.1, and I think manager evaluation was a 3.9. So uh, on a scale of 5, uh, the highest scoring one we've got, other than test cases passed, is a 3.9. And, and uh, you know, you'll notice if you look at my scoring rubric, which uh, I, I guess you can't, but uh, I gave the management evaluation a 2 on the topic of measurement truly uh, reflects productivity. Uh, and I also gave it only a three on the topic uh, or the criteria of resist gaming by individual contributors. Uh, and I gave it a two on the topic of objective or independently verifiable. So uh, there's no question uh, manager evaluation is not a panacea. The, the, the question to ask, though, is what other measure performs better across the board in these full set of criteria? And the answer is, None of them actually perform better across the board when you really start uh, when you really start looking at them according to the scoring rubric that I defined. So, uh, you know, I, the the reality is for individual individual contributor uh, productivity measures, none of the measures scored that well. There we go. Here's another one. Since you said output input was hard to state, how can we say that product Productivity is that different? Okay. Um, since you said output input was hard to state, how can we say that productivity is that different? Yeah. So, um, so there are two things going on there. At the beginning of the talk, I did talk about the fact that getting an organization to define meaningful output and input uh, was hard to define in a clear, clear way. And then I went into some of the uh, more research-oriented discussion of the very variables in productivity. Uh, it actually does turn out that if what we're really trying to measure is variability in productivity, we can hold a lot of the, the variables constant in a way that we couldn't do if we were actually in a commercial setting. So for example, we can do a study where we get uh, 100 people, 100 professional programmers in our study, or 20, some number, the typical sample size in the studies is around 20. So let's say we get 20 uh, developers. They all have at least seven years of experience. And we give them all the same assignment. We can do that in a research setting. So we actually have controlled a lot of those confounding variables. But that's in a research setting. Uh, in a commercial setting, we're, we're virtually never going to do that. We're not going to take 20 of our staff and have them all do the same uh, meaningfully sized assignment. Uh, you know, There are very limited examples of that where an organization might have a coding wars contest on a weekend or something. And those examples bear out the general uh, result that you find significant differences in uh, the amount of time given to the same task. So the one is really, you know, how do we know that there really are 10x or higher differences among individuals? The answer to that is we've got research in a research setting uh, that has found that. And the other question is, well, OK, then why am I saying it's hard to measure output and input? The answer to that is because I'm not talking about that being difficult to measure in a research setting. I'm talking about that being difficult to measure in a commercial context, uh, which is what most of us are concerned with. I could give a different talk about measuring productivity in a research setting. There are still lots of issues that come up there, but it's not the same set of issues that come up in a commercial setting. OK. Steve, we've reached the top of the hour, but we have lots of questions. Can you stay on for the audience, for those who can stay on? Yeah, I could I can stay on for a few more minutes, sure. Okay, great. How about what would you recommend we use to normalize the scorecard? For example, how do we compare a thirty person team 
against a three-person team? That's an interesting question. Uh, I think that I don't think that's actually the major challenge in putting the scorecard together. I think the major challenge in putting the scorecard together is doing the work at the organizational level to define the criteria on the scorecard in such a way that if a team performs well against those criteria, it actually is supporting the objectives and strategy of the organization. So I actually see that as the larger challenge. And we've worked with companies in doing that. And as I said at the, toward the beginning of the talk, that is a multi-day process involving uh, upper level stakeholders from the organization. Uh, if you put the scorecard together well, then I don't think that you really uh, you really uh, have much of an issue with the difference in team size. If we go back to the example uh, that I gave, for example, uh, I don't think there's really any difference between the ability of the example I presented, which I've, I think I'm showing to the audience now, uh, whether you've got a 30-person team or a three-person team, on-time delivery, unaffected by that, initial defect rate, unaffected, plus 90-day defect rate, unaffected, uh, percent of plan functionality, not affected. You know, none of these factors are dependent on the size of the team. So um, I think certainly it would be possible to design a scorecard that would do poorly on different sized teams, but I also think it's possible to design one that uh, does fine on, on teams of all sizes. Okay. Here's another interesting question, and this is, does the Hawthorne effect or the fact that measuring if known improves productivity, uh, oh wait, does the Hawthorne effect, the fact that measuring if, if known improves productivity apply to programmers also? Do, you, do we become more productive by virtue of being measured? <laughs> yeah, so uh, I, I doubt everyone knows what the Hawthorne effect is, but the question refers to a study that was done at the Hawthorne Electric Works in, in the 1930s, and, and what they were trying to do was try to study the effect of different environmental factors on uh, worker output at an uh, at a electrical plant. And so they turned up the lights to see if increased lighting would actually have a uh, positive or negative effect on productivity. And when they turned up the lights, they found productivity increased. And then having reached that conclusion, at the end of the study, they turned down the lights. And they were surprised to find that when they turned down the lights, productivity went up again. Uh, and the conclusion of the study was that the fact that the people knew they were being studied uh, had a positive effect on productivity. And that was another example, by the way, of a confounding effect where uh, if people know they're being studied, the fact that they know they're being studied can affect the outcome. For the Hawthorne effect is interesting because for research purposes, it's a confounding factor uh, that we have to try to figure out how to, how to uh, account for. But in a commercial setting, there's no reason we shouldn't try to take advantage of the Hawthorne effect on every project. That is, I really think the, the, the takeaway from the Hawthorne uh, experiment is that if people feel like they're special, uh, special enough to be studied, then they tend to perform better. And so you see the long history we have in the software world and the tech world of Skunk Works projects uh, performing really well. Well, I think part of the reason Skunk Works projects perform well is that the teams feel special because they're being allowed to do something in a way uh, that's different from how their organization normally does uh, does software. So, you know, if I'm a manager in an organization and I can actually uh, have my team feel like it is being treated specially and studied 100% uh, of the time over a multi-year period, I'm going to do that. I, I'd really like to try to take advantage of the Hawthorne effect uh, as a manager and, uh, but my response there is different if I'm a manager in a commercial setting versus being a researcher where I'm really trying to figure out, well, did turning up the lights make a difference or did turning down the lights make a difference? Okay, thank you. Here's another question. Are there any studies that address the goodness of different measures? You showed what makes a poor or good measure. You showed us a table addressing different criteria but not all the criteria are equal. Have you addressed their relative importance? Yeah, so it's an interesting question. Um, I have a version of the, evaluate, of the scoring rubric that has weights for the different uh, measures. Uh, I think what happens is that when you start fooling around with weights, 
then I think the exercise of presenting the scoring rubric itself becomes more susceptible to gaming. And so I would agree that the different, uh, uh, different uh, considerations probably ought to have different weights. They certainly are not all uh, equal in terms of their importance. I, I agree with that. Uh, I think if you actually took a version of this uh, table and you, and you did create a version where you assign different weights to the different uh, criteria and you did a sensitivity analysis on it, I think what you'd find is that the averages uh, shown toward the bottom of the table don't actually change all that much uh, unless you're actually driving toward a uh, specific conclusion. You could certainly manipulate the weights so that uh, one of the factors does better. But if you're really just going through, which I've done, and, uh, and saying how much difference does it make if we you know, have a higher weight on, say, for example, the consideration of measurement truly reflecting productivity uh, and a lower weight on something like objective independently variable, it, it turns out it doesn't really affect the overall results that much. Okay. Here we go. I think this might be our last question, Steve, but it's a good one. It's, have you worked with or are you aware of anyone that has a software productivity measurement program that, after considering the cost of administering such a program, provides real value improving their economic output as a result of the program? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, so there's no, there is no question that there are people out there who will tell you that they have software productivity measure programs, measurement programs that are cost effective and that after administering those programs provide real value. So there's no question that there are companies out there that will, consulting companies out there that will tell you that. Um, I think what, you know, as I said before, what we've found is that, is that the key really is getting the technical teams aligned with what the business really wants them to do. And as technical people, as analytical people, as people who tend to get really focused on details, I think we can get distracted at what one of our clients referred to as the navel-gazing uh, metrics. That is, these very, very detailed metrics that are at best loosely correlated with business value. And when that happens, you're very subject to the idea of saying, wow, this team really, really rapidly produced a lot of high-quality code on a project that ultimately got canceled and never delivered anything into the marketplace or anything into the, the operations of the business. So it's really, really important that when the business starts looking at productivity, they look at the bigger picture of productivity and including factors like, wow, you know, if a quarter of our projects never see the light of day, we launch them, we work on them, we uh, suck up technical resources on them, and then we cancel them when they're, uh, when they're behind schedule or something like that. Uh, you know, you're really missing the point if you're trying to optimize those teams going faster rather than trying not to have those teams get invested on projects that never go anywhere in the first place. So that leads me back to the, back to the original point, which is I think the, the most, you know, we can certainly do things like do relative measures, and we've had great success with uh, scrum teams in particular where measuring story points within a team can give that, that team a really good sense of how much it's improving or whether it's improving. So that kind of measure can be tremendously useful within a team for very selected purposes, but for kind of cross-organizational cross comparison purposes, uh, that requires a, a much more of kind of a scorecard approach in our experience. So that's what, that's what we've focused on. Oh, very good. Um, Steve, thanks so much for joining us today. You always do such a great job, and we always have an audience full of lots of questions, so unfortunately we haven't been able to address all of them. But before I close it out, Steve, do you have anything you'd like to share with the audience? Well, I just I really appreciate everyone joining us today. Uh, like I said, I have a lot of interest and passion on this topic, and I'm very pleased that we had so many people show up to uh, share that interest and passion. Great. Yeah, it's excellent. Nice big audience. So thanks again, Steve. We really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. And I'd also like to thank the audience for joining in this event, sponsored by Constructs and presented by Application Development Trends. Thanks, everybody, and enjoy the rest of your day.